Welcome back to the Flow and Flourish podcast, people. I am Nicole Roan, your host, and I'm glad that you're here. Happy October, by the way. This is what I call the holiday kickoff season. If you are a pumpkin fan, aren't you just so excited that everything has a hint of pumpkin in it? Now, I'm on the fence about it, but I saw pumpkin cheesecake the other day, and I actually was slightly interested. I didn't try it, but it really did look good. With Halloween and Thanksgiving upon us, I have already started to see Christmas decorations, and I'm kind of excited. I'm not going to lie. The holidays actually get me through the cold here in the Midwest because it personally gives me something to look forward to. It's not like we can really be outside, so... (laughs) It gives me a chance to use my party planning and organizing skills to get our family together. Of course, it will be a bit different this year with COVID, but I'm still looking forward to all of it. I just really love the energy, the lights, and the decorations, and you already know I love the food. So since we downsized in April, my husband has already been asking me what are we going to do for Thanksgiving and Where are we going to do it? So we are starting to figure that out. And my husband, Chef Roan, is already working on the holiday menu because he likes to switch it up for what we eat for the holidays since Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's are all so close. So this year, so far, we've landed on a traditional Thanksgiving, and then we're going to do like a seafood soiree for Christmas. I swear, I tell him all the time, I really do keep him (laughs) because he cooks. But enough about food, though, because I'm making myself hungry, and the way my goals are set up, ain't nobody got time to be giving in to their cravings right now, okay? Anywho, we are in week three of the Heart Flow series, and speaking of my husband, today's episode is all about how your significant other impacts your heart flow your balance, and your overall capacity. Now, before you say, this isn't for me, wait a minute and hear me out. You don't have to be married to benefit from this episode because everything I talk about can be applied whether you're single, dating, engaged, or married. While we all like to brag and boast on the good things in our relationship, today, I want to help shed some light on evaluating whether or not your relationship with your partner has toxic tendencies. And if after listening to this, you determine you found a few, there's no shame or judgment. Know that first and foremost. The whole reason I'm talking about this today is because many of us question ourselves when it comes to this kind of relationship and we look externally to figure it out. Look no more because I'm here to help you and I'll be sharing strategies for assessing the relationship, acknowledging and accepting where the relationship is at, and giving you some action steps to figure out what to do next. Honestly, all of this can be applied to any meaningful relationship you have, but I'm focusing specifically on your significant other because the partner you choose is connected to your ability to succeed. Who you choose to spend your time and energy with will make or break you. And you've probably heard this before, but I'll say it again. You are the company you keep. And that's not just for friendships. So in last week's episode, I talked about how your children have the ability to pull on your heartstrings like nobody else on the planet. Now, the other people who have a similar effect on you are your partners. This is the person you are in a committed relationship with, the one who knows you inside and out, and the one you are going through this thing called life with. Being in love is a beautiful thing and has numerous health benefits for us, including reduced blood pressure and anxiety, natural pain control, and even faster healing from injuries. Did y'all know that? And that's because while most of us think and feel that love is a heart thing, it's also a brain thing. When you are in love, it literally changes your brain. Dopamine, which is the chemical in our brains associated with feelings of pleasure, is increased significantly. 
And so is oxytocin, which is known as the cuddle hormone. Now, what most don't know, however, is that too much dopamine can make you ignore important information from other parts of the brain, and it's also been known to impact our decision-making part of the brain. The amygdala specifically becomes deactivated, and this is this like almond-shaped part of your brain, and the other part of the brain that I'm referring to is your frontal cortex. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that coordinates our fear responses and it helps us stay safe in potentially dangerous situations. And then the frontal cortex is the place we use to actually make decisions. So when activity in this area of our brain is decreased, we tend to make not so good judgments and it explains why we write off red flags in the beginning of a romantic relationship. So what does this have to do with toxic tendencies in a relationship, Nicole? Um, Everything. Think about it. When things are new and you're getting to know one another, you are likely on this natural high about how fine they are, how good they smell, how much money they make, or how funny they are. So chances are you may not be paying attention to the little red flags that show up Or if you are aware, you might just be totally dismissing them. All the warm and fuzzies you feel can literally block your judgment. And I know this from personal experience. I've shared pretty openly with you how I was in an abusive relationship. And I can sit here and tell you that I did ignore red flags. Partially because I was in a really low place in my life when we got together. But also because I was legit in denial. Some of the things I remember justifying were his not so good relationship with his mom and sister, his strong connection to his ex at the time, and how he would react when I spent time with friends or my family. I said things like, just because he doesn't get along with his mom or the women in his life has nothing to do with me, or he and his ex were together for so long. And, you know, after being together for a long time, you can't just cut things off like that. And my favorite was, he just wants to spend time with me. That's why he acts like that when I'm away from him. Nope. Stop right there, sis. Red flags all day long. So let's talk about what a toxic relationship is. By definition, it's a relationship between two or more people that is unhealthy and dysfunctional. It can be physically, verbally, emotionally, or mentally abusive, or it can be a combination of all of those characteristics, which is what makes it unsafe to stay in. This kind of relationship literally contaminates your self-esteem, your happiness, and the way you see yourself in the world. For me, all of that makes perfect sense, but let's be honest, nobody in the history of everdom starts a relationship with someone who is abusive, talks to you sideways, or makes you feel stupid off the bat. But by experience, I know that it doesn't show up exactly or honestly at all like that. Instead, it's a lot more subtle, similar to those red flags I mentioned earlier. Believe it or not, I didn't even realize I was in a toxic relationship until I was reading an article in the newspaper that had one of those quizzes that tell you whether your relationship is healthy or unhealthy. And I know that sounds crazy, and you probably have that look on your face like I do when I hear those, I didn't know I was pregnant stories. Like, lady, how didn't you know that? But clearly, I felt a little something in my gut, and by the grace of God, I was led to this newspaper on that day. Mind you, the only time I used to pick up the newspaper was for horoscopes. And anyway, when I took the quiz, I answered, I think it was like eight out of 10 of the questions. I answered yes to those. And I was shocked. At the time, I remember feeling like, how did I end up here? I know better than this. Why did it take me doing a quiz in a random newspaper to realize I was in a toxic relationship? What's wrong with me? In retrospect, it makes sense to me now because we see what we want to see and we believe what we want to believe. One more time, we see what we want to see 
and therefore we believe what we want to believe, especially when it comes to matters of the heart. And if you couple that with the extra dopamine you get at the onset of the relationship, aiding you and being in love and and all of that, and then you add on top of that the decreased frontal cortex activity that impacts your judgment and decisions, and boom, there you have it, folks, a recipe for a toxic relationship. I want to also add that a lot of these toxic behaviors start happening to us pretty early on. So by the time that we are in a serious relationship, much of what we are experiencing already feels normal. So we are kind of desensitized. Speaking of which, let me share a few statistics with you. Violent and toxic behavior often begins between 6th and 12th grade. Keep in mind that 72% of the 13 and 14 year olds that are around consider themselves dating. Yep, I'm doing the air quotes again. They're dating, right? (laughs) 1.5 million high school students in the U.S. alone admit to being intentionally hit or physically harmed in the last year by someone they are romantically involved with. 33% of adolescents in America are victims to physical, verbal, or emotional dating abuse, which means that one in three young people will be or are currently in an abusive or unhealthy relationship. Only one-third of teens who were involved in an abusive relationship confided in someone about the violence, which means two-thirds of them aren't even saying anything, so they can't even get the help that they need, and they're probably repeating these same patterns. And lastly, females between the ages of 16 and 24 are about three times more likely than the rest of the population to be abused by an intimate partner. I honestly didn't even know those numbers were so high for young people until I did my research, and it really breaks my heart. As a mother, a sister, an auntie, and a godmother, That terrifies me, but it also encourages me to empower you to know the facts so we can teach ourselves and our loved ones early on so that we don't normalize any of this. With that, though, chances are that before you even graduated high school, you were in or had been exposed to unhealthy, toxic behavior from someone you've dated. So let's talk about how to assess that whether it was in the past or it's something that you're experiencing now. So what does a toxic relationship look like in real life? In general, a toxic partner behaves in inappropriate, controlling, and manipulative behaviors pretty much on a daily basis. And to the outside world, he or she may put on a front and appear to be the best thing since sliced bread, which likely confuses you even more. And this is what I call the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde syndrome. So they treat you like crap behind closed doors, but they look sparkly and and full of gold to the outside eye. Aside from that, some of the most common signs or symptoms that you're in a toxic or unhealthy relationship are, number one, it feels bad all the time. Not just here or there, but literally every single day. Instead of awkwardness being the exception, it's actually the norm. No matter what you do or what kind of interactions you have, it just feels off and that feeling doesn't go away. If it does, it's probably just for a short amount of time and then you're right back to not feeling good about the relationship despite your best efforts. Number two, constant judgment and belittlement. This one can be tricky because at first, The comments are usually easily dismissed because they seem lighthearted or as if it's a joke. For example, you hear, you drive like an old lady, or why do you always have to get so dressed up? We're just going to the grocery store. Oftentimes, it's said with a smile, and you both might actually laugh at it, but over time, consistent comments like this can make you question yourself. Another telltale sign in this department is if you do call out the behavior or the belittlement, he or she will likely say, 
something like, wow, I was just kidding. Can't you take a joke? Listen, at the end of the day, if you tell someone you don't like it and they continue their behavior, no matter how small it may seem, it's not okay. You feel how you feel and that needs to be respected, period. A third sign is controlling and isolation. While we all want our other halves to miss us when we're gone, or we want to be the only one that they spend time with, you have to pay attention to when and how this shows up. And honestly, having outside friendships and connections are healthy for your relationship. This is tricky too, because at first it can seem cute and sweet, but again, over time, you'll start to notice a pattern. With me, this showed up whenever my mom called. He would need me to get off the phone and do something for him. Or whenever I would go out with my friends, he would catch a whole attitude to the point where when I would get back home, he would be sleeping on the couch. And this was like my punishment for going out. What kind of crazy mess is that? Another major sign that you will likely see is that you do all the work. You are the one saying, hey, I want to improve our relationship, so I think we should do date night. Or, hey, you know, I've been feeling disconnected and like we're always into it with each other. So I was thinking about us doing couples counseling. In a healthy relationship, even if the other person isn't feeling it, for the sake of the relationship, they will agree or you'll be able to come to some kind of compromise. In a toxic relationship, though, this and everything else will be shot down. You have to know that you alone are not responsible for making sure that the relationship works. It takes two. You absolutely have to have something to work with. And if the other person isn't willing to do the work, you doing the work for you both is pointless. Now, the last one that I have for you is one that I personally am still recovering from to this day. And it's when you avoid expressing your needs. As humans, we are creatures of habit, right? So it only makes sense that when you're in a relationship and you've tried expressing your needs time and time again, only to have them unmet or completely dismissed, eventually you will likely stop trying. For me, I just avoided altogether saying what I was thinking or feeling most, if not all of the time because it always seemed to end up in an argument or I found myself having to defend what I was expressing. I was exhausted across the board and I just didn't have the mental, physical, or emotional capacity to do it. I went on autopilot because it was easier and it gave me a sense of normalcy in the middle of dysfunction, if that even makes any sense. And then this carried over into all areas of my life. I was afraid to tell my friends and family what I was thinking or feeling, let alone expressing my needs. I even convinced myself that my needs wouldn't be met anyway, which led me to recurring thoughts of my needs don't matter and neither do my thoughts or feelings. And even at work, it was showing up there too. I went from the one who always had a suggestion, question, or solution to the quiet one at the back of the room who was hesitant and terrified to speak up about projects, policies, or just simply sharing what I thought. I completely lost myself for a really, really long time, and it's taken me over a decade to truly heal and feel comfortable speaking up in both my personal and professional life. So now that you have an idea of what a toxic relationship looks like or what some of those typical signs are, it's time to do the hard part. And it's the hard work. And this is where you have to be honest with yourself. If after listening to this, you feel like you might be in a situation, it's okay. You're in a safe space and you were led here to this specific episode for a reason. It's time to stop dismissing your gut and seeing what you want to see. You cannot fix what you won't face, and the longer you avoid dealing with it, the greater the damage. This is where we're acknowledging and accepting where we are in the relationship. 
And I know we've been talking about your significant other, but all of this, again, really can be and should be applied to all of the different close relationships in your life. Regardless of who it is and how long it's been going on, if it's toxic, it's likely already changing you. You have to start thinking about and get clear on the condition of the relationship and how you fit in. And maybe this isn't for you specifically, but maybe it's for someone you know who is dealing with something like this. If that someone has trusted you enough to open up and share with you about what's happening, I need you to share this with them so they can know that they're not alone. Now, after you have acknowledged and accepted what is or isn't happening in your relationship, this is where the rubber meets the road. You've heard me say that knowing is half the battle. And my mentor, Patrice Washington, says, so what now what? So what are you going to do with what you know? There are three key steps that I took to get my life on track and be brave enough to really face my fears of being alone and, you know, stop worrying about what my friends and family would think if they found out I was in this sort of relationship and then I'm out of it now. The first one is to reflect on your values. When you start here, it sets the tone and makes it a little easier to do everything I just talked about. I love technology, but I'm a pen and paper kind of chick, so I always recommend writing it out so you can see it on paper. Most people say they value their health, their peace of mind, their family, and love in general. When you look at your relationships through a values lens, it almost forces you to align what you do, and who you spend your time with on a daily basis. So for example, if you value your health, you have to ask yourself if the relationship or relationships you have support that value. When it comes to your significant other, you have to know that the partner you choose is a direct reflection of your values. So if you are allowing someone to treat you in ways that are less than you deserve, what does that say about your values? And this isn't me being judgmental by any means. I just want you to sit with that and understand the connection. When I did this, I honestly didn't list myself as a value, but I did list my daughter. And I shared last week in the episode how I used my love for her to really guide me in decisions. And she was absolutely the number one reason that I decided to let my toxic relationship go. I never wanted to be the reason that she stayed in a relationship like that because she saw me do it. So for the sake of her and her future, I decided I had to get up out of there. So number two is you have to reconnect with your gut. Your intuition and gut feelings were designed specifically to let you know that something isn't right. And so many of us dismiss these feelings and toss them to the side for many reasons. When it comes to your partner, maybe you downplay what you feel because you've been together forever. You have children involved. Or like me, maybe you're worried about what your friends and family will say. You have to know that those spidey senses that you have, they are there to protect you and they're for your benefit. You don't have to have proof or a logical explanation. I like to say that they are signs from God and they're supposed to get your attention. Now, personally, I'm getting a lot better at trusting my gut, but I promise you, I no longer just dismiss it or ignore it completely. Even what I'm doing now with the podcast was a gut feeling And I'm glad I'm following through so I can make the impact on the lives that I'm making around the world. My third and final step is for you to remember your why. Why are you in the relationship in the first place? For love, companionship, to build a life with someone? Have you been able to fulfill those needs since being in this relationship? If not, why? If remembering why you got into the relationship isn't enough, 
Think about why you feel the way that you do that led you to even assess the relationship in the first place. In most situations, your why is what keeps you going when things get hard and you feel like giving up. Keep your why at the front of your brain as you go through this process. And this is a process, all of it. Checking in with your heart and paying attention to how your relationships impact your ability to show up for yourself as a mom, as a partner, and as an employee is work. And honestly, it's probably the hardest work you'll ever have to do because of how strong these relationships pull on your heartstrings. You just have to remember that energy goes where attention flows, and if you are finding yourself at maximum capacity and overwhelmed, you should start with taking a look at who you spend your time and energy with and on. Now here I am, heavy again today, but it needs to be said. When I was trying to Google my way through what to do and how to do it when it came to my toxic relationship and even toxic friendships, I was more confused after looking online. And I realized there is no one size fits all approach because every single situation is different. But this is at least a guide and a baseline to help you if there is a lack of balance between your personal and professional life. Start with assessing those relationships. Now, I hope this has helped you and will help someone that you know. Go back to those statistics I mentioned earlier and check in on your young people around you. It's never too early to start talking about this with the ones you love, especially those in middle and high school. Share this with all the women you know so they can share it with their daughters, nieces, cousins, sisters, and their friends. I believe it takes a village philosophy. So let's all do what we can to ensure that you, your friends, and families have the tools and information necessary to live life to the fullest. Next week will be the last episode in the Heart Flow series, and we'll be talking about the relationship with your friends. Everybody needs a sister circle or a group of friends that they can go on this journey with. And we will talk about how to make sure you have who you need and weeding out those you may not need anymore that no longer serve you. Make sure you subscribe and rate the podcast because it makes a world of difference. And if you haven't already added yourself to my email list, head on over to NicoleRone.com and do that. That way you can stay up to date on what's happening in the Flow and Flourish community. And I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but if this is your first time here, welcome and go back to the first few episodes so you can learn more about me and how I help you smooth the lines between work and home. Now, don't forget to connect with me in social media, okay? Tell me how this is helping you because I love the feedback and I am so thankful that you take time out of your week, every week to listen to me. I pray that you and your loved ones stay healthy that you are prioritizing and practicing self-care, and that you have a fantastic rest of the week. As always, I look forward to helping you increase your capacity for sustainable success by guiding you on how to create balance between your personal and professional life without ever having to sacrifice yourself, your family, and what matters most to you. Talk to you next week.